very much for inviting me. Um, I am Christine DeStefano. I'm a professor in the University of South Carolina, and uh, I'm very glad to be here to talk to you today. Um, I, I want to talk about machine learning. Uh, and again, too, this is something that I'm getting interested in. Uh, this is something that, um, as we know, it's a current uh, interest in the field. And so I believe that as professors and as scholars, uh, it's our job to remain current in the field, to train students, to do good research, and to assist communities. Um, so like many of you, I began to hear a lot about machine learning. And starting to uh, think about machine learning and where it has come from, um, you may have heard about the big data wave that has been um, that has been prevalent in research roughly for the last 10 years. Um, there have been methods for collecting large data sets through process data or just um, algorithms like um, machine, I'm sorry, mechanical Turk that would lend itself to collecting large uh, samples of data. Uh, so researchers have more and more access to these large data sets. And with that, there's more and more ways to analyze these data sets with uh, new algorithms and faster computing capability. Um, these large data sets are something that in psychological assessment we have ready access to. Um, another thing that you may be familiar with is many terms like artificial intelligence, big data, data mining, language generation. And these are commonplace in research and uh, actually um, do have appearances in our everyday life, whether we recognize it implicitly or not. Um, looking specifically at psychology and psychological assessment, um, this big data wave has expanded to the social sciences. Uh, I did a quick search of the, uh, the American Psychological Association data set to see how many articles have been published since 2019. And I used keywords of um, psychological assessment, psychology, and then deep learning, big data, machine learning. And even in this short time, roughly 5,000 articles were uh, apparent. So this uh, topic is gaining um, prevalence and it is uh, becoming very popular in our field. The articles were on a wide range of, of issues from introductory articles to applications that would examine various um, instruments and also comparisons across different algorithms for analyzing data. So there's uh, just a lot of information out there on various um, topics. I wanted to take this and focus a little bit more on psycho psychological assessment and how that intersects with machine learning. Um, so what I want to do too is, is um, give you a little disclaimer. Uh, I am maybe at the same place where many of you are. I'm getting involved with machine learning uh, and I recognize that many others are doing the same. So I wanted to share uh, how I'm getting involved in this field, uh, give you some information about language and terms and how these uh, relate to what we do. Um, I'm not an expert, but I, I want to share what, what I know and hopefully it will help others uh, interested in the field. Um, this talk, I'm going to organize it into three parts, just talk a little bit uh, about what is machine learning, what does it do, talk a little bit about what methods are used for data analysis, and then some applications and extensions to psychological assessment, and then maybe some future um, activities for research. 
So in general, just thinking uh, about machine learning and what it is and why it's so prevalent, um, it's a subfield of artificial intelligence. Uh, machine learning comes from pattern recognition and theories that say that computers can learn without being without being programmed to perform specific tasks. So um, the goal here was to see if the computers could uh, go through an iterative learning component as expo when they're exposed to new data to independently adapt. Um, the goal here is to learn from previous computations, produce reliable and repeatable decisions, and reliable and repeatable results. Uh, this science is not new, but it's, as you've seen, getting a lot of attention. Um, there are some familiar examples that you may uh, have um, been exposed to and whether or not known that these were based on machine learning, um, at least in the US, there was a big discussion about using Facebook data to predict Trump supporters uh, from non-Trump supporters to be able to target advertisements to different groups. Um, online recommendations, if, you're in, if you use a service like Amazon or Netflix and they give you um, movie suggestions, that's uh, in this vein of machine learning, as well as fraud detection, where you may be alerted if a purchase shows up on your credit card that seems out of your usual pattern. Um, that's something that's related to this machine learning um, area. Um, machine learning is also discussed uh, and discussed in context with other areas like data mining and deep learning. Um, the way it's, uh, it, it seems to be organized is that these all have a similar goal to extract patterns, relationships to make decisions. Um, machine learning seems to be more of the overarching uh, umbrella. Um, data mining is a subset to uh, identify unknown patterns from the data. And so it may involve some traditional methods uh, as well as machine learning. Deep learning is another uh, term that you may run across. And this is a subset of machine learning and well, uh, as well. Um, with deep learning, it's using special types of neural networks, which are pathways to learn patterns in large amounts of data. Um, with machine learning itself, um, here you can think of this as a, a way to understand the structure of data, fit theoretical distributions, and use an iterative approach so we can automate this learning. Um, in general to just where it came from, um, in the late 50s, uh, the, the machine learning term was coined uh, based on the idea that we shouldn't have to teach computers, but if we have a set of predictable patterns, then the machine could learn on its own. Um, beginning in the 1980s, there were many advances that were made, but it was really the 2000s where we had uh, some rapid discoveries and uh, computing capabilities made these methods more and more commonplace. Uh, and then in the 2000s, there are some of the, um, I guess, the um, areas of machine learning in the news, such as um, the ability of a machine to be humans at games like chess, Jeopardy, Go, and recognizing faces, and even recognizing cats on the internet. 
Um, in general, you can see uh, this little flow chart that has some steps to go through to um, do a machine learning process from getting the data, cleaning, preparing. Uh, those are things that we um, typically do with, uh, with any analysis. But the model training, testing the data, and improvement may be something different. Um, We'll talk about those more in a second, but just as an example, um, with the COVID pandemic, many um, courses uh, have been put online. And so an example of a machine learning um, uh, study may be to identify those students who would be at risk for failing or uh, dropping out of an online course. What we would do here would be to take a series of input, and these could be survey questions as well as um, demographic um, information, other um, notes like the final test scores, and output would be key items which would predict those students that would be likely to fail or not do well in this online class. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about this um, training and improvement and talk a bit about how the um, machine learning algorithms improve given that that's key with this process. So if our goal is to optimize a performance criterion using data or experiences, uh, what happens in between? So we have data coming into the system, but how does this model improve? Well, um, there are many analysis strategies, so we're just going to keep this general and say, starting with an analysis strategy, we'll be training this data or training our machine. And the training is an iterative procedure that we'll use to improve our analyses and their accuracy. So we'll be using this algorithm going through an iterative process, fine tuning, for example, finding variables that may improve the selection and um, to come to an ending model. There are terms that, that you'll see in machine learning, such as feature engineering, which is transforming variables, feature selection, which means to uncover a subset of variables from a large set which are optimal for prediction. Um, multiple algorithms, which is basically just using multiple methods to determine uh, if the same answer, the same uh, ending model is obtained. Uh, algorithm tuning or refinement, and then ensemble methods, which combine multiple data sets. Um, to improve accuracy, there are things that we can do, such as adding more data, deciding how we're going to treat missing cases and outliers, as well as to look at cross-classification procedures. So I think that one reason that machine learning may be so attractive to psychological assessment is that many of these components are commonplace or familiar with things that we do already. So while some of the procedures may not be exactly the same, we may have different methods that we use in machine learning, much of what we do in um, psychological assessment is similar. So for example, the training using iterative procedures, well, we're used to using algorithms like uh, maximum likelihood or EM algorithms within the IRT framework that go through and converge on a solution. Um, transforming variables, um, log transformations, or uh, using standard scores, those are common things that we do. Um, uncovering subsets of variables and so forth. So if you take a look at, at this list, and this is just my attempt to sort of um, 
make the language of machine learning fit into our framework, things that we are familiar with in psychometrics and things that we um, may be used to using uh, on a semi-daily basis to show that these, uh, the machine learning really isn't so different, just the language may be different. Moving from there too, I also looked at some of the courses that um, these um, areas like uh, Statistical Horizons or Stats Camp, where they teach a lot of um, psychometrics or psychological assessment, just to see what sort of strategies they were teaching for learning machine uh, learning methods. Um, we talked a little bit about advanced variable selection, and you may be familiar with some of these techniques like using multiple regression as well as stepwise regression procedures, uh, lasso regression, or even spline methods. Uh, classification techniques are things that uh, we use in, in psychometrics as well, uh, cluster analysis, k-nearest neighbor techniques, uh, logistic regression, um, two things that are maybe a little bit new, the naive Bayes classifier, which is um, built on our Bayes method or Bayes theorem using a probabilistic method for classification uh, or our support vector machines. Um, this is similar in a way to um, Factor analysis, where we're looking for a hyperplane that divides data into groups um, and used for classification there. Um, what seems to be new in machine learning are, or, or newer in the sense that uh, we may not have as much experience with in the psychological assessment field are these methods of partitioning and ensemble models. Um, so these deal with classification, regression, uh, random forest, and then bagging and, and boosting. So I thought I'd, I'd share with you a little bit about uh, these methods and how they relate to some things that um, you may be more familiar with. Um, decision trees are uh, a staple in these um, classification methods to partition data into groups by evaluating at different decision points called nodes. And um, you can see this is a, a example that I, I found from a, a great website, which is cited here below, um, that shows from our data clearly how you can see evaluation points, right, to uh, put our data into separate groups. From our individual trees, if this is our de decision tree, one of the most common methods in machine learning is called random forest. And so these individual decision trees will come together to build a, a forest, um, which is a, a, a nice metaphor to think of as well. Um, so we have here a, a, a series of individual trees that you can see come together to build a forest. And each tree produces a prediction. And our goal here is to find the classification that has the most votes. And that will um, arrive or give us our, the solution from our uh, analysis. Um, when we come together and have many trees. This is our ensemble um, word that we had seen earlier. Um, additional, so some of, there are prerequisites, um, just like any um, statistical procedure. Um, we want to make sure that we have some signal right, that we, we want to have um, more signal than noise in these, and that we have 
um, variables or um, features that are not highly correlated. And that's similar to some other things we've seen, right, with multicollinearity and so forth in regression. So same sort of um, methodology here with our, our random forest and classifications. Uh, two other methods or two other features that are commonly discussed are what's called bagging and boosting. Um, so just in general too, um, bagging and boosting are methods that create sets of predictors. So if I have a large number of variables or uh, features to choose from, bagging would look to see how this classification uh, um, is, um, how we arrive at, at a class using randomly sampled features from this overall set. So different trees can be evaluated in this overall forest to see how well a certain solution works at uh, predicting an outcome. Um, boosting is used to reduce error, and I think of this sort of like an adaptive learning type situation. Um, boosting looks at including weights on samples that classify correctly, and I was thinking of this in uh, concert with an adaptive learning that would choose the next item in a testing situation where um, based on an examinee's um, answer to the previous question. Uh, if, interest, if you're interested in getting into this, there are many specialized um, software packages or applications that are out there um, that you can use. Uh, but some of the software packages that are familiar to psychologists and psychometricians are also expanding to include machine learning. And this includes SAS, SPSS, R has many packages, as well as uh, M plus has a, a recent addition, including decision trees, uh, and these may be called SEM trees or M plus trees in the literature. Um, so I found it reassuring that if I am interested in machine learning, I didn't have to, for example, um, learn a, a totally different package that many of the applications that I'm familiar with and that I use uh, have machine learning capabilities uh, already or are new features to these existing programs. Okay, so I wanted to, with that background, think about machine learning and specifically how it relates to psychological assessment, knowing that uh, it, be, it is becoming popular. So um, thinking through what are some avenues that may be relevant or useful to psychology and psychological assessments, um, three things came to, to mind and from reviewing the literature. Um, and these were um, first and foremost, building prediction models for uh, issues that we use surveys or instruments for. So these academic or testing issues. Um, second are methodological investigations. We, we typically do a lot of that in, in psychological assessment to see which methodology works better than others. <clears throat> and then third could be to help with this uh, replicability crisis that has been uh, um, forefront in the psychology news. Um, so looking at um, this prediction models, because I think this is partly um, the most um, uh, going to be the most common application of machine learning. Um, we know with what we do in psychology and psychological assessment that many things that we are testing for, these um, decisions are based on impre imprecise measurement or guesswork. And, and I mean that in the sense that um, there isn't like 
uh, with medicine, uh, a blood test or imaging that can be used to concretely detect many disorders that we deal with. Uh, we rely on um, survey information and, and from um, testing, from um, questionnaires, history, and reports to make these uh, diagnoses. So uh, some examples are, are listed there, but many things that we do in psychology, we don't have a hard and fast way to concrete concretely say that yes, a person has um, disorder X versus no, they don't. Um, given that we make a, a diagnosis or, or make a recommendation, it may be difficult to determine what's the correct way to go ahead and, and start treating this disorder. Uh, the treatment may rely on trial and error and what works for one individual may not work for another individual with the same disorder. Well, um, using machine learning, uh, we could build a model that predicts an important outcome. Um, some of these disorders, like uh, depression, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's have been um, most commonly studied with machine learning, and they may intersect with what uh, we do with, um, within psychology. But other areas are, are gaining prevalence as well, such as um, psychopathology um, and studies of the MMPI, specifically uh, online learning success, social emotional risk, uh, even things like method effects or, or examining aberrant responses and uh, diagnostic assessment have been gaining more and more prevalence in the literature. Um, beyond building a prediction model, um, there's also some um, assistance from machine learning to identify variables that can predict the outcome where the benefit is indirect. And, and what I mean here is rather than uh, maybe giving a survey that may look at um, suicidal thoughts or self-injury behaviors where a person may pick up on what we're trying to measure and give us socially desirable results, a smaller subset of variables could be identified that allow us to um, make a prediction about uh, an outcome without asking direct questions about it. Uh, and then another area that is um, gaining prevalence too is to identify certain subclusters or groups that respond differently to various treatments. Um, there's some work being done by um, Hassi at, at McMaster University, who's looking at different ways, uh, subclusters of depression and how um, those uh, different subgroups respond to various treatments. And those um, subgroups were, um, are, were um, formed by some machine learning predictions. Uh, another area um, that was mentioned was the replication crisis. Um, I know you're familiar <clears throat> with this, that um, roughly around 2010, um, the, rep the issue of being able to reproduce results um, has uh, taken forefront in psychology where issues of uh, publication bias, um, assessments, I'm sorry, incentives for publishing, um, looking at data to maybe find statistically significant results to ensure that the work is published rather than to report uh, findings um, have contributed to methodological concerns and the inability to be able to find the same uh, outcomes if experiments were repeated. Um, and this is not um, just in psychology, other fields have been experiencing the same replication crisis as well. 
Uh, machine learning may give us a way to help with some of this replication um, by increasing generalizations. Uh, one of the methods um, used or prominent in machine learning cross-validation um, looks at this issue specifically by uh, validating a model many times. Um, and this is called a K-fold cross-validation um, where it's usually a five or 10-fold method. Uh, this is an example that I, that I pulled. Um, and I can give you that reference. I'm sorry, I thought I had it on here, um, of a picture with a tenfold cross-validation method where the 20% um, is held out for validation. You can see that shaded. And then the model is trained on the other 80%. And the ending model would then be validated on this holdout sample. Um, again, it's it's similar to some things that are suggested and what we do in in um, psychology, but this uh, iterative or or larger um, method to construct these cross validations is something that's a little more unique with machine learning. Um, some articles, um, the, this one noted below by Yang, uh, is actually looking at characteristics of articles. You know, what are the pieces of the experiment or characteristics of, of authors, their publication records, and so forth that may contribute to um, results that can be replicated. So this um, looking at sort of maybe a meta-analysis, if you will, with um, characteristics of articles and how they contribute to, um, to solid results may be a way to use machine learning to help um, solve this replicability crisis. Um, and then a last area that uh, mentioned to uh, for machine learning and advancements uh, is methodological studies. Uh, many of the methods that we use in machine learning um, will benefit or have benefited from psychometric research, such as um, principal components analysis, um, cluster analysis, mixture modeling. Those are techniques that are uh, used in um, psychology and, and psychological assessment research uh, that researchers may look at distinctions or advancing these methods themselves to then be applied to other problems within the machine learning area. Um, there's becoming more and more work in examining methodology as it relates to uh, areas that we're uh, familiar with in um, psychometrics and psychology. Uh, there are a few articles here that I've, um, that I've pulled, but looking at um, the reliability of variables themselves and how that contributes to the selection process, um, dealing with issues of small sample sizes, uh, various numbers of predictors, and then differences between algorithms is a place for much research as we move forward with machine learning. Uh, I wanted to just give you an example of how machine learning could be used with um, with psychological assessment. And so uh, this is, is something that I've been uh, looking at uh, with some colleagues um, in the US. Uh, the school systems here are increasingly adopting what's called the MTSS or the multi-tiered system of support framework to assist students. Um, this is done in, um, in academics as well as social emotional learning, where the goal is to identify students at risk early and then to intervene before students fail. 
Um, in terms of academics, machine learning has been applied for areas such as dyslexia, um, dropping out of high school due to uh, failing grades, and also for uh, dropping out of university studies. Uh, but I was interested in looking at how social emotional screening, given that that is at the forefront of the MTSS system, how machine learning could be applied to social emotional issues. Um, in terms of social emotional or behavioral health in, in the US school systems, uh, this is becoming prominent across the, the nation. So uh, you can see here the snapshot of um, social emotional learning from um, uh, the Castle Organization, which is uh, one of the largest social emotional learning um, organizations in the US. Uh, and they have gone across the country to see how the country looks in terms of social emotional standards in schools. Uh, and you can see here that we have um, all of our states who have social emotional learning starting in preschool and then uh, extended into the K-12 learning environment for roughly half of the nation. Uh, there are standards that are taught in schools for um, for our curriculum, just like we would have an academic curriculum, more and more states are having social emotional cur curriculum, uh, and then resources for parents um, to assist outside of the classroom. Um, and in some grade levels, this can even be used for school success, for accountability or optional um, measurements for the accountability framework. Um, where I am in South Carolina, the law here requires social, emotional, and behavioral screening of children. While the law has written um, to include children from kindergarten to 12th grade, um, this just became um, legislation in 2019, and the focus is more on the early grades, the K through six. Um, screening activities for social emotional learning are conducted by teachers at the start of the school year, where a screening um, tool can be selected from one of 13 that are on a list approved by the State Department of Education. And then the data from that screening is supposed to be enacted upon uh, where different tiers of the MTSS framework um, guide teachers with what to do with the information. Uh, and that may vary from interventions given to the whole classroom versus smaller groups with students at risk, and then targeted assistance for students at that highest tier that may have severe risk or um, an entrenched disorder. Um, but if we're dealing with social emotional assessment, an accurate assessment of risk is critical. Um, we have screeners and they typically focus on classification accuracy by looking at sensitivity and or specificity rates. And the, uh, these rates are often reported in the manuals uh, for our various tools. And these uh, sensitivity and specificity rates may be at subscale or overall scale levels, um, telling us for sensitivity how likely it is that a student with a disorder would be identified and specificity uh, those without a disorder would be um, shown that they don't have the disorder. Um, some caveats with interpreting manual information. Um, many of these disorders may have lower class 
classification accuracy rates, uh, especially for disorders that are hard to observe in the classroom, such as internalizing problems. Um, and then uh, the true status is not often known. So um, the presence or absence of a disorder may be, um, may be classified by using a competing scale and then uh, using one as an outcome and the other scale as the predictor. So um, with this study, we look to see, could we build a prediction rule with machine learning um, to identify children at risk where our focus was on emotional and behavioral disorders. Uh, the screening tool that we used was the, it's called the BEST, the Behavioral and Emotional Screening System, uh, child form. And uh, this form had 27 items and a risk score was, uh, was provided on a T metric uh, where higher scores denoted more risk. Um, this was um, rated by teachers within the first two months of school. Um, a norming data set here was used where we were lucky enough to have a diagnosis of EBD that was given by an outside source. Uh, the parents uh, reported these diagnoses from doctors or clinicians. Um, the sample that we used had roughly 2,400 cases, but only 120 um, students that were diagnosed with emotional and behavioral disorders. Uh, the accuracy rate for this was roughly 0.7 using a receiver operating characteristic curve. So our goal here was to see if we could build a better uh, prediction than just using a T-score to denote risk uh, with, where high T-scores showed um, more evidence of risk. Um, we used um, all of the indicators instead of a sum score or something, all of the individual indicators were used as well as some um, sorry, demographic information about children and uh, parent education. Um, we, we did have some problems with uh, missing data. We did some imputation to um, deal with the missing data, but that's a, a problem, not only in machine learning, but other analyses, right? How to um, deal with your missing data. And then we also note too that we had this small sample size. We had roughly 5% or 120 cases that showed um, a EBD, uh, emotional and behavioral um, disorder diagnosis. Um, so to do this uh, study too, we did, um, take our large sample and we randomly uh, split this into two samples where one would be used for training. Um, but that sample that we used for training, uh, we created a, a third sample where we um, had a EBD or diagnosis group that was created um, to be balanced in terms of equal numbers of children with and without the disorder. Uh, and we compared that to a unbalanced situation where the data had, I wanna say roughly uh, 50 or so cases um, that were chosen you know, at random uh, from this larger Pool, but we had a, a, a high uh, number of cases that did not show presence of the disorder. Um, and then again, too, with these two training samples, balanced or unbalanced, we kept one group 
as a holdout sample. Um, we compared some methods that are typically used um, in machine learning to look for classification, and then uh, went to develop to examine the accuracy on this sample two holdout or validation sample. So in sum, we had six samples, right? We have um, three methods and two samples, unbalanced and balanced. And uh, what we were able to see with these um, different training samples was that using our over sampling, um, so just statistically um, putting in cases to uh, make a balanced number of cases, the model was, uh, overall much better at identifying those cases um, that showed the presence of a diagnosis. Our sensitivity rate was highest um, with our neural network procedure uh, when we had oversampling, um, but our other methods worked well. Um, if I can show you these rock curves where our receiver operating curve methods uh, look to see how much better these methods are over um, chance. Oversampling uh, appeared to be optimal. So we were able to create a classification rule for social emotional behavioral disorders based on all of the screening items and demographic information to help classify children um, at risk with greater accuracy than just using our uh, overall T-score to, to denote risk. Um, just in, in summary too, just going back to machine learning, um, there are some noted pitfalls that can be obstacles. So besides unbalanced groups, dealing with missing data, um, differences between the algorithms that we're using, um, there are some things in the literature, model hacking, where we may only report the best performing model um, rather than um, all the models that were tried. Um, this is something that we um, may know from other things such as exploratory factor analysis, right? Where only the best model is reported. Um, reporting many models or ensembles can help with that. Uh, another area is lack of interpretability, where there's a trade-off between accuracy and prediction and um, a complex model. So um, this may be compared, or many models could be compared here to look at the accuracy of a more simple model versus something that's um, more complex to see if the trade-off between accuracy and simplicity is uh, acceptable. Uh, but in summary too, as our big data becomes more prevalent, uh, machine learning will uh, be extended, more and more applications will become, become prevalent in psychology and psychological assessment. Um, there are increases in the methodology and the applications in many areas uh, and uh, renewed interest in using this for testing, especially in the US here for some of those disorders um, such as social emotional screening that may be prevalent uh, in many schools. Uh, so I think that um, not just between the methods, examination, evaluation of algorithms is something that will gain uh, more attention in the future. So I think this is a, a area that's here to stay and, and hopefully that the assistance and benefits of this procedure will be applicable to researchers in science and psychology and beyond. Uh, thank you very much for um, 
for listening. I'm happy to answer any, any questions or, or help any way I can. <laughs>